the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the live recording of the Short Circuit podcast. Uh, We are at Penn Law. Thank you to the Federalist Society, the American Constitution Society, and others for inviting and hosting us. Uh, If uh, you law students out there want us to come to your law school to record a podcast, let us know, uh, just like Cole did, uh, and we will figure something out. Uh, I'm Ina Bidwell, by the way, an attorney with the Institute for Justice. Uh, With me are three amazing panelists, uh, Claire Finkelstein, Mitch Berman, and Matthew Stigler. Today on the podcast, we will discuss three recently released Third Circuit opinions and talk a bit about the Third Circuit in general. Uh, Before we begin and before I introduce my panelists in greater detail, let me just ask that you folks subscribe to our weekly newsletter where we discuss important circuit court opinions, as Cole mentioned, released each week. Uh, Let me also ask that uh, law students who are listening apply to our summer clerkships, which are now called David Kennedy Fellowships. They are paid Yay! And they provide a wonderful opportunity to try your hand in cutting edge constitutional litigation. Just Google Institute for Justice summer clerkships and you should be able to find us and the application page. Now on to the panelists. Claire Finkelstein is Algernon Biddle Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy here at the University of Pennsylvania. She is also a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. In addition to being a prolific academic writer on topics in involving national security, the law of war, as well as ethical issues arising in this context, Claire is widely published outside of academia in places like the New York Times, Washington Post, and The Hill. She also appears on TV and radio, including my favorite program of all time, On Point, on NPR. Uh, Claire got her JD from Yale and her PhD in philosophy from the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome, Claire. Listeners here already know how accomplished and amazing you are, so I want, to, uh, I want you to tell us very quickly about your little sister and the amazing book that she wrote. My sister? Yes. Kath- <laughs> <laughs> I know that's out there, but I love that book and I want students to know about it. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, my sister is a journalist in the healthcare field, in particular on the subject of uh, pharmaceuticals. And uh, she wrote a book about uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the generic drug industry, uh, that deals with um, FDA uh, investigations. So when these investigations occur in the US, uh, they occur with no notice. So you can see exactly what's going on in uh, a drug plant. But when they occur overseas, where most of our pharmaceuticals are made, Uh, they typically receive quite a bit of notice. And uh, she uncovered, with the help of uh, an an investigator, uh, quite quite a lot of uh, misconduct uh, in those Indian plants. Indeed, yes. So generic drugs are not all equal, so make sure that you check where they're actually manufactured. The book is called The Bottle of Lies, and it's fascinating. Uh, So now on to Matthew Stigler. Uh, He practices law at the law office of Matthew Stigler, uh, right here in Philadelphia. He's a superstar litigator and was recently complimented by a Third Circuit judge as one of the, and I quote, finest attorneys and advocates that have ever come before me. Uh, Matthew also has his own blog on the Third Circuit, where he posts about every single published decision issued by the court, usually in a matter of hours. Uh, Matthew got his law degree from the University of North Carolina. After law school, he clerked on the Tenth Circuit. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you. I'm Tell us here. about contractions in legal writing. Uh, Contractions in legal writing. Um, You know, I'm in favor of contractions in legal writing, except to the extent that judges don't like them, and there's judges who don't like them, so I don't use them. Uh, Justice Justice Kagan, I think, is not opposed to them. Yeah, right. And, and you know, I think probably two-thirds of the judges who read your briefs don't even notice uh, that you're doing it, but... Uh, You know, we're in the job of trying to persuade everybody. And uh, if there's some folks who feel like it's informal, even if even if I think that it's the right way to go, I don't use them. Better be safe than sorry. Um, Now, Mitch Berman, he is Leon Melter, professor of law and professor of philosophy here at Penn Law. He specializes in criminal law, constitutional law and most importantly, in the jurisprudence of sport. 
Among his recent articles are Kennedy's Legacy, A Principled Justice, The Tragedy of Justice Scalia, and Our Principled Constitution, which, by the way, was published right here in the Pennsylvania Law Review. Before becoming a professor at Penn Law, Mitch taught at the University of Texas at Austin. He got his law degree and his master's in political science from the University of Michigan. After law school, Mitch clerked on the Fourth Circuit. Welcome, Mitch. And please tell us more about your campaign against the indisputable visual evidence standard used in American football. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a sister. Uh, <laughs> and I'm in favor of contractions. Uh, well, the question is, why indisputable visual evidence? That's a, you can look at that as an appellate standard of review. It's a very demanding appellate standard of review. If you care about error correction, you should have a less demanding standard. That's the view in a small nutshell. But I encourage all of you who are interested in that question to, uh, to take my course in the jurisprudence of sport. If you're, so if you're second years, you can take it next year. And otherwise, uh, encourage people at your own law school to teach the course. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. So let's, uh, before we uh, launch into the cases, let's briefly talk about the Third Circuit. So it's a relatively small court, only 14 active judges. Uh, it's also a relatively young court. There are no Reagan and no H.W. Bush appointees and only two Clinton appointees. Uh, it is a relatively moderate court. It only has six judges nominated by uh, Democrat presidents and eight nominated by Republican ones, so relatively evenly matched. Uh, it hears cases coming from the Virgin Islands, uh, in addition to Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey. Uh, so, uh, Matthew, uh, as a specialist on the Third Circuit, what am I missing? Well, um, I mean, it, it's, it, the Third Circuit has a long tradition as a centrist, a moderate court. Um, it's, it's never been a court uh, filled with, with ideological bomb throwers. Um, uh, and, and, I, and that's been consistent for decades, and, and I think it's going to remain consistent. It, it, there was a, a lot of uh, pub, uh, news coverage of the fact that the Third Circuit was the first of the circuits to be uh, so-called flipped by Trump because uh, it, when he entered office, it had a majority of Democratic-appointed judges. Now it has a majority of Republican-nominated uh, judges. Um, but uh, but I, I, I don't think that particular distinction has a whole lot of significance for, for practitioners, and, uh, and I don't think it reflects a, a, any important change in, in, in the court's direction today. Is it because the court already has kind of like a well-established identity? Uh, w w what do you think? So the, the Fifth Circuit, I think, is a good example of where, uh, you know, new appointees really kind of created some serious stir. But... In the Third Circuit, you still seem to have a lot of collegiality and um, uh, decisions that, for example, nationwide injunction that was affirmed by the Third Circuit against the Trump administration in the Obamacare case. Yeah, and, and it, it, two or three of the judges uh, appointed by President Trump are still quite new. And so, I mean, I don't think we really know yet exactly uh, what the impact will be on the culture of the court. Um, but it's a deeply entrenched culture. It's a culture that, that Chief Judge Smith cares about passionately. Uh, and, and as I say, it's, it's gone back for decades. So it, I, I, I pretty confidently expect that we're not going to see anything on the Third Circuit comparable to, to what we've seen in the Fifth Circuit uh, in the past year or so. And is the en banc practice kind of reflective of that in that I think I heard Chief Justice Smith talk about how they don't really like en banc, granting en banc reviews in certain cases because that's essentially like, you know, puts justices on the judges on the spot and makes them to pick sides. Yeah, the Third Circuit is definitely not a court that does a whole lot of um, uh, ideological en banc granting. They, they, they grant en banc 
very rarely it's a couple cases per year or something like one out of every thousand cases that they decide. So it doesn't happen very much. And when it does happen, it's very rarely the kind of thing that you see in some more contentious circuits where, you know, like uh, two judges who aren't part of the overall court majority decided one way. And so the en banc court decides to, to come in and, and reverse it because they disagree with the outcome. There just isn't very much of that that happens in the Third Circuit. Um, so, uh, I mean, that, that, that's definitely a, an important part of the identity of the court. Okay, excellent. I think that's a very good overview. Uh, now let's jump into the cases. Uh, let's start with Mitch Berman and the case Adams versus Governor of Delaware. Okay, this is a really interesting case. Uh, I hadn't read it before, and I'm very pleased that you drew my attention to it. So thank you for selecting this case for us to discuss. The case involves a constitutional challenge to provisions of the Delaware Constitution concerning the appointment of judges to the various courts in Delaware. For over a century, uh, the Delaware Constitution has provided in one form or another that judges who are appointed to the court have to satisfy some conditions concerning their party affiliation. And those conditions have changed over time. The current uh, conditions uh, involve, or the, the current law involves sort of three aspects, two conditions and uh, another aspect that I'll get to in a moment. So there are, I think, five different types of courts in Delaware, and not all of these rules, the same rules apply to all of them. One is a bare majority component, as the court discusses. The bare majority component says that there cannot be more than a, a, a bare majority of judges on any court from a single political party. So if a court has an even number of judges, then uh, there could be one more than the even number, if it's an, then half of the, that number from a from the one political party. Obviously, if it's odd, then it can just have uh, one more than half in any event. That applies to all of the, the courts in Delaware. This is the, the bare majority component or condition, as I'll call it. In addition, with respect to a few of the, the courts, the Supreme Court, the Chancery Court, um, another one of the court I should know, but it's not that important for present purposes. There's another condition uh, that the court refers to here as the major political party component. And that is those judges who are, do not comprise the majority have to be members of the other major political party. And we know that the two major political parties in Delaware, as in the rest of this country, are the Democratic and Republican parties. So the idea is that all judges will be either Democrats or Republicans. And then the last element is concerns how the governor will choose whom to appoint. And that works through a nominating commission. The governor appoints 11 members to this commission, and then a 12th is appointed by the, uh, the president of the Delaware, Delaware State Bar. And they will give the governor a slate of candidates from which uh, he could choose. Uh, so they, when an opening comes up in one of the courts, the, there'll be published a statement that says, okay, we've got an opening, apply if you're interested. Here are the qualifications, maybe I have to be a lawyer. And furthermore, this particular opening is open only for Democrats, or this is open only for Republicans. Or it could be that a particular opening is open for either a Democrat or a Republican. So that's the basic structure. And uh, Mr. Adams, James Adams, is a lawyer, a member of the bar in Delaware, and he wanted to be a judge. But he's an independent. He had been a Democrat. He uh, gave up his membership in the Democratic Party. And he wanted to be considered for an appointment to a court. And because of the major political party condition, he was unable to be considered. And he, said, he filed suit challenging this condition, the, uh, the major political party condition, as a violation of the First Amendment right of freedom of association. 
So that's the basic structure. I think to, to state the facts in that way, I would expect that most listeners would think, that's got to be unconstitutional. It's got to be unconstitutional. How could it be that a state can establish as a firm legal condition on eligibility to be a judge that you are a member of one of two political parties? Imagine if the Delaware Constitution had a similar provision with respect to the governorship or members in the uh, in the legislature. You cannot be governor of this state unless you are a Democrat or a Republican. That just seems clearly outrageous. Uh, now, I said that this was an interesting case. If I just stopped there, it wouldn't be a very interesting case because it seems sort of like a gimme. What makes it an interesting case is the precedential background. So there are two things that you have to know here. One is the supreme, relevant Supreme Court precedent, and the other is precedents from two other circuits, the Sixth and Seventh Circuits, that more or less came to different results on, on the same issue. The Third Circuit treated this as really a clear circuit split. They did treat it as though the Sixth and Seventh Circuits had squarely come out the other way. I don't think it's quite as square as they presented. But uh, we'll get to that in a moment. So the relevant precedents are three, uh, Supreme Court precedents are three cases that concern political patronage. One is uh, the Elrod case in, uh, in 1976, which held that public employees cannot generally be fired solely based on partisan affiliation. This case involved some employees in a sheriff's, sheriff's office. A new sheriff came in and just fired the... I think, the, the Republicans to appoint Democrats. And so the court said you can't do that. Party affiliation cannot be the condition for public employment, except for positions that involved policymaking. And these positions clearly didn't involve policymaking. The next case, Branty in 1980, elaborated on this policymaking exception. And what the court, this involved uh, the firing of assistant public defenders on part for reasons of party affiliation. And what the court in Branty said was that the ultimate inquiry is not whether the label policymaker applies. We're not going to be uh, arch formalists here and just try to take this label policymaker and figure out whether a particular position involves making policy. Instead, they said, the question is whether the hiring authority can demonstrate that party affiliation is an appropriate requirement for the effective performance of the public office involved. That's a quote. And then uh, the Rutan case in 1990 uh, extended Elrod and Branty to say that the same rules and considerations applied not just to firing decisions, but to hiring and promotion and transfer decisions. So those were the relevant precedents. And what happened in the Sixth and Seventh Circuits, uh, in the Seventh Circuit, there was a, a case called, pardon me, it was a 1988 case actually decided before Rutan, Kurowski versus Krzyzewski, which concerned also public defenders and said, look, you can't, you can't fire public defenders for partisan reasons. That's basically what Branty had held. But in the course of holding that, the court did say that it would be appropriate to appoint uh, judges, judges based on partisan grounds relying upon Elrod and Branty. The reason I say that it's not squarely precedent is because one might treat those statements in, in uh, Kurowski as dicta because that's not exactly what the case involved. What the court in, what the Seventh Circuit in an Easterbrook opinion said was following Branty, the label policymaker shouldn't be dispositive here. And it said, I'm quoting now, the right question is whether there may be genuine debate about how best to carry out the duties of the office in question and a corresponding need for an employee committed to the objectives of the reigning faction. Now, you might think that just that articulation of what the standard should be should lead to the result that 
judges cannot be fired or appointed on strictly partisan grounds, on grounds of their political affiliation. Because you might think that judges, it's not a, a necessity for judges to be committed to the objectives of the reigning faction. But after stating that as the relevant standard, Easterbrook went on to say, well, look, there are all sorts of political considerations. Appoint, uh, the appointing authorities might be interested in whether judges, and here's a quote, agree with them on important jurisprudential questions. Someone appointing judges might want a judge who's a law and order judge or someone who's friendly to criminal defendants. Exactly how the court thought that those considerations, you might want a law and order judge, could translate into you might want a judge who's just a member of the Republican Party was sort of unstated in the Seventh Circuit decision. I think that it's somewhat conflated political with partisan, which are not the very same considerations. Uh, the, the Sixth Circuit sort of followed that later uh, in a case could you uh, flesh that distinction out a bit, political versus partisan, and why those are not the same? Well, the elaboration of what political meant, here's what the, the Seventh Circuit said. A judge both makes and implements governmental policy. A judge may be suspicious of the police or sympathetic to them, stern or lenient in sentencing. And political debates rage about such questions. Uh, Holders of the appointing authority may seek to ensure that judges agree with them on important jurisprudential questions. So jurisprudential, political, political in the sense of what do you think matters with respect to matters of state in a broad sense. Those are political considerations. Those are, one might think, a little different from the question of whether you are a member of a particular political party. And I think the Seventh Circuit was a little, a little slippery or a little sloppy about conflating, using political as synonymous with partisan affiliation. So uh, the Third Circuit essentially has no dissent, right? It's a unanimous opinion, but very interestingly, they write um, a concurrence, and concurrence is also written by the exactly same panel. Um, so um, why are they doing it, uh, and what are they trying to say in concurrence? Well, can I just say one thing before I get to sure, that? Sure, sure. Thanks. Uh, in, in responding to the, the Sixth and Seventh Circuits, the Third Circuit said something very interesting, I think. It said, the question before us is not whether judges make policy. It's whether they make policies that necessarily reflect the political will and partisan goals of the party in question. That's more the standard, they think, than the question of, do the courts do things that have a political component or affect policy in such a way that the appointing authority might care about it? Basically, it's something like a loyalty test. Is it appropriate for the appointing authority to think that the people whom uh, the authority is appointing in that position should be loyal to the partisan goals of that party? And there, the Third Circuit said, third circuit said if that's the test, it's got to be that judges don't fall into that test. They're not policymakers for purposes of Elrod Brant Branty and Rutan. Um, and I think that's clearly right. And when it, there's a cert petition pending now. I'll get to your question in just one second, Anya. Uh, there's a cert petition pending. And I've got to say, the likelihood that this court that's so concerned to say, we don't have Democratic justices and Republican justices. We just have justices. And a, su a Supreme Court Chief Justice who says judges are umpires, no way, no how, oh, is going to say, yep, yeah, but actually judges are policymakers who have to be loyal to the, uh, the political goals of the reigning political party. Do you think the cert will be granted or will they just oh, a, choose to? I don't. Above my pay grade. Predicting what the court's going to do, I'll, I'll leave it to... To Matthew, perhaps. <laughs> um, my guess is probably not. There, what could lead them to do so is if they think that this really is a very square circuit split, which is why I said that the squareness of the circuit split is a matter of some dispute. What makes this a further interesting case is the question that Anya sort of provoked, I think. One thing that makes it interesting is just the existence of the circuit split. The other thing that makes it interesting is this interesting concurrence, a, concurrence, a concurring opinion written by uh, Judge McKee joined by Judges Restrepo and Fuentes. So the same judges joined the majority opinion and joined the concurrence. And the concurrence said, 
uh, I joined the majority. This is clearly wrong. You can't do this. This is a violation of freedom of association. But here's the thing. There's really a good reason for this policy. This policy wasn't adopted. The constitutional provisions weren't adopted for crass partisan reasons. They were adopted for good governance sorts of reasons. And it is the fact, the judges all agreed, that Delaware has been thought of as sort of a model jurisdiction in terms of its, juris, uh, of its judges, of its judiciary. Practitioners in Delaware are very high on the, uh, on the professionalism, competence, and relative lack of ideological bias among its judiciary. And the, all the judges on the Third Circuit said that could be attributed, at least in part, to these constitutional provisions. The idea that we're going to have a partisan balance on the, on the courts. So the judges were saying, even though we think this is a violation of the First Amendment, we're a little, we recognize this is sort of sound policy. It's not adopted for crass reasons. And we are concerned that the effect of this ruling might be to change practices in Delaware in a way that is going to lead to a more partisan, less competent, less well-respected judiciary. But then the judges said, look, there are ways to achieve this objective, the goals that the Delaware Constitution promotes uh, in ways that are short of a firm condition, an actual flat eligibility condition that ensures only members of the Democratic and Republican Party can become uh, members of judges. The, it's a short concurrence. It doesn't flesh out how Delaware could go about this, but it expresses some optimism that this decision really won't uh, spell the death knell of a uh, competent, professional, relatively nonpartisan Delaware judiciary. And I guess time will tell. And I want to open that up to the panel to kind of talk a little bit more about state court judges and the ways that they get on the benches, right? Like Justice O'Connor famously, you know, championed this against elected judiciary um, cause, right? Because you know, on the one hand, you can see problems with elected judges. On the other hand, you have this model where you have a very kind of precise formula for how to appoint folks on the bench, uh, but then it, it gets struck down as unconstitutional. So, um, what uh, do you? What would be a good way? in your minds to appoint judges, or just talk about how certain ways of doing it are problematic? Well, um, I thought this was also a, a rather fascinating case, um, but uh, perhaps for slightly different reasons. Um, uh, Mitch says that, that there may be sound policy reasons for having this uh, political balance requirement in Delaware. But let me give an analogy, and I wonder what you would say to this, Mitch. Um, suppose the law required that there be a certain percentage of women on the bench or a certain percentage of underrepresented minorities. Um, now, uh, it's interesting because we, we've never seen that kind of provision. We, we now have, for the first time, a provision in California requiring 50% uh, women on, I think it's 50%, on corporate boards uh, for the first time. But uh, we've never seen a provision like that for appointing judges. Um, I would think that political party does not justify the kind of representat mandated representation that you might think more naturally would be justified by wanting to have some level of diversity in the uh, in state or federal benches. Uh, but I suspect that no such provision would um, would fly, and so I just wonder. Um, uh, what you would say to that kind of comparison. Now, that's a great question, Claire. Uh, first of all, I'm skeptical of the constitutionality of the California uh, rules. But, yeah. uh, but the, that question does draw straight into affirmative action type questions and the constitutionality thereof. And the general rule following from from Justice Powell's governing opinion in Bakke is plus yes, quote a no. Plus yes, quote a no. And it's revealing, I think, or at least interesting, that in the Sixth Circuit case, Newman versus Voinovich, which for want of time I didn't discuss, sort of touches on just this factor. So there's a concurring opinion in the, the Newman case 
That case concerned whether the governor could take party affiliation into account in appointing judges. And the answer was yes, the governor could. But what the concurrence said was it's one thing to take it into account, to take it as a plus factor, one might say. It's another thing for a governor to have a flat rule that says, I'm only going to consider Republicans. Now, even that, it's a little bit unrealistic to think that that's not the practice of the, the presidents, for example. A president is going to probably appoint only members of the Republican Party if he's a president or a Democrat if he's a, a Democrat. Um, but there's still something to this idea that a plus factor is one thing, but a flat rule is another thing. And it's yet more so if that flat rule is codified and entrenched in the Constitution. So there's no way of getting around it. I'm sympathetic to that thought. It's also like the question of how much partisanship in redistricting should be too much. So the, most justices are of the view that you can take partisanship into account, but it can't be too extreme putting aside whether it's justiciable. So what's really dispositive, or I think really important in this case, is not that it sought to prohibit a governor from taking into account party affiliation and appointment, but that it said, here, as a constitutional requirement, you just are flatly ineligible. So to sort of tie that up, and if my response wasn't sufficient, how that response to your question was insufficiently clear. I guess one might say doctrinally, this comes down to the narrow tailoring prong, right? So even insofar as a state might have legitimate interests in trying to promote diversity, whether it's racial or gender diversity, with respect to its particular appointments, to have a flat rule that is more quota-like, and here very strict, is the type of thing which is likely to fail narrow tailoring uh, at least if you get into strict scrutiny. Yeah, I would just say, and I want to pass it on to sure. you, but I would just say that it seems to me the, rel the most important rights here are the rights of the litigants that come before these judges. Um, and the right comparison would be diversity, for example, on a jury. Uh, and the right that you have in criminal cases under the Sixth Amendment uh, to be tried before a jury of your peers. Um, now, it seems to me that way of thinking would be really uh, more spot on for thinking about what the composition of the judicial panels should be uh, than thinking about the need to balance political parties. I guess on that we disagree. I think both in the, in the jury case and certainly in this case, uh, the interests and rights of the parties are certainly relevant. But I actually think that, uh, that there's in, in my view, a really strong and compelling constitutional right on behalf of individuals to be judges. So I give. Oh, I don't disagree. With okay. That. Yeah. So there, I think that the the would be judicial candidate in his or her or their own uh, right can say, no, I cannot be excluded from this position just on the basis that I choose not I to join one of the I political agree. parties. So, so what about the standing issue here? This guy seemed like the kind of guy who. Uh, courts are very fond of denying on standing. He, he is a lifelong Democrat who read a law review article saying that this uh, regime might be unconstitutional. Apparently, within days of reading that article, switched his, uh, switched his <laughs> registration from Democrat to, to independent. independent, and he didn't apply for or get denied a judgeship after having switched it. He filed the suit immediately. <laughs> And in fact, he, he had been retired and on inactive status as a member of the Delaware Bar. He, wouldn't, he wasn't practicing law. Uh, and, and again, right around this exact same time, he activated his bar membership and filed this suit. So it seems like a guy who said, I really want to challenge this law, and so I'm going to do it. Um, but, the, but the panel found that he had standing here. A, a, any, any thought on that or thought about that as a, as a cert hook? Or? Yeah, that, that's a, a good question. I wasn't aware of all the background. I should say part of the reason I wasn't aware of all of it was the, the opinion. This is really an aside, but I'll get it off my chest. The opinion says this guy read a law review article, but doesn't do us the favor of citing the darn article. Uh, uh, I didn't think that was very nice. Uh, <laughs> It might, it might run afoul of some of the strict standing rules, which I think are pretty bunk anyway. Uh, really, what could he have done? The, the, the legal rules are very clear. You cannot apply. You're not eligible for this position unless you are a member of the party. The, the job qualification goes out and says, in effect, 
uh, Republicans need not apply or Democrats need not apply. You are not eligible. So I think that when the court does say that it would have been uh, sort of an exercise in futility for uh, Mr. Adams to have sent in an application, I think they're right about that. It just would have been booted. But, but I, I take your point that this isn't the ideal, the ideal uh, person we would like better. We'd like someone who didn't have, who had been a who had applied and gotten turned down. Got yeah. and turned All right. So now, now let me toss out another thing. Um, this is a panel of three judges who were uh, appointed by Democratic presidents and presumably the beneficiary of this ruling in a blue state like Delaware, if you get rid of the, the party balance requirement, presumably the likely effect of that would be that you're more likely to get more Democratic judges in the state judiciary than there are currently. Do do you see any of that as being relevant to the question of whether whether the the Supreme Court might be interested in what taking the, a look? Again, what the Supreme Court's interested in, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really want to pine on it. It does not have any bearing on my judgment about the case. Uh, I didn't know that stuff, and I nonetheless think it's an easy case. Uh, although I do recognize the force of the concurrence. I mean, there is really good policy behind it, but there are ways of trying to pursue that policy which – don't prohibit people from becoming or being eligible based on their non-party affiliation. I do, again, return to the analogy there. Basically, we have three branches of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. It would be crazy to think that with respect to either of the other two branches, a state could, as a matter of constitutional requirements, uh, require that you have to be a member of two political parties. Of, of one or the other of the well, two. Well, after all, you, you could do that for the legislature in that case, right? Yeah, yeah, you I mean, can't that's, do that. I that's the reductio. Exactly, the, or, yeah. or the governor. And there are, there's a very interesting body of law concerning ballot access restrictions. But even those basically are the idea that states can impose something like a 5% uh, signature requirement and various requirements to make sure that really, really marginal candidates and parties don't get on the ballot for reasons of uh, confusion and the like. But... The Supreme Court precedent there is really quite clear. There's no way you could have a rule that says you can't be a governor or a legislator unless you're one of these, a member of these parties. So notwithstanding the possible blue interest in the state, it just seems like still a relatively easy case to me. And before we move on, a word in defense of test cases. They have a very deep and rich uh, history and tradition in this country. Famously, Plessy versus Ferguson was a test case that didn't quite work out the way plaintiffs were hoping, but that's kind of often how constitutional law develops in this country in that uh, test cases are being brought and uh, constitutional doctrines are tested. One other very quick thing, I'm sorry for, for being long on this, but one of the quick interesting aspect of the case is, remember I said there's the bare majority requirement and the major political party requirement. This case challenged the major political party requirement, got that struck down, and then the major party requirement was struck down on non-severability grounds. That raises the question of whether, if the, with respect to the other courts where that, for which the major political party requirement only applies, whether someone could challenge that independently, and whether that would be unconstitutional. I won't say more about that for want of time, but that's a further issue in the, in the case, I mean, that, that the case raises or points to. That's absolutely right. Uh, let's move on now to Claire's case, uh, Pellegrino versus TSA. All right, well, so this is a case about the status of TSA officers. Um, so these are, the, these are the folks who do the screenings that you get when you fly, every time you fly. Uh, anywhere. And uh, this plaintiff, uh, Mrs. Pellegrino, was uh, going through a TSA screening and she got rather roughed up uh, if her version of events is to be believed. Uh, she was taken in a separate screening room and uh, her belongings were very aggressively searched. They were dumped all over the floor. Then it appears that on at least two occasions, the TSA officers pretended that she had engaged in some kind of assault on them. The result was that she was charged with 10 different crimes, uh, came, came out of that screening, uh, uh, herself then named as a criminal defendant uh, in the case. Um, she, uh, all of those uh, 
criminal uh, charges were dropped. And following that, she and her husband sued for the treatment that she endured going through the TSA screenings. Um, She sued in uh, two causes of actions. One is an action that comes straight from the fact that her Fourth Amendment rights were violated. Uh, You know, the Fourth Amendment is the amendment uh, that Uh, says that no one should be subject to unreasonable searches and seizures. However, the difficulty with that amendment is that it really only does you any good if you are a criminal defendant and your case is uh, coming before a court, uh, because what it gives you a right to is has is that any evidence that violates the Fourth Amendment cannot be presented in court. It is excluded under the so-called exclusionary rule. However, if you are subjected to an illegal search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment and you are not charged with a crime, then in theory you have no remedy for the fact that you were subjected to that illegal search and seizure. So how to enforce your Fourth Amendment rights when you are not a criminal defendant? Well, um, a former, uh, uh, an older case uh, called Bivens against six unnamed federal agents allowed that the, uh, that a uh, person who was subject to an illegal search and seizure could actually bring a civil action based on a wrongful search and seizure because of violation of her Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, And um, that is something that we don't have otherwise in our system, that you can actually read off a civil cause of action from a mere violation of your constitutional rights. Well, unfortunately for Mrs. Pellegrino, in this case, the lower court dismissed her Bivens action and said that, in fact, no, she was she did not have a, a Bivens cause of action. However, another cause of action did stick and uh, went up to the Third Circuit, and she prevailed on it, which is the Alien Tort Claims Act. Uh, so under this provision, although normally the state has what's called sovereign immunity and you cannot sue uh, the federal government uh, and you cannot sue state governments unless they consent to be sued, Congress passed um, a statute allowing certain exceptions to that principle of sovereign immunity. And uh, the basic principle here under the Alien Tort Claims Act is that you may sue uh, if the individual is acting in his official capacity um, and you are suing the federal agency for the harm uh, and uh, some series of exceptions later, this individual is an investigative or a law enforcement officer. So the question then arose whether or not these TSA officials were investigative or law enforcement officials. And the argument that was made against this proposition was that these are, um, this is an administrative screening. It's not a search or seizure within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment because that applies only to criminal cases. Uh, So does it really apply in this situation? And the question turned on whether or not these officers had the ability to do things like make arrests, seize evidence, uh, and subject individuals to criminal charges. The majority argued that, yes, obviously they did. And in this case, of course, the screening, the supposed administrative screening, led to a whole bunch of criminal charges being filed against Mrs. Pellegrino. The dissent said, well, no, that doesn't mean that those officers were acting as law enforcement officials in any way uh, because um, they weren't making the arrest. They had to refer any criminal evidence that occurred to their supervisors who would refer it to law enforcement who would make the arrests. Um, So the question is whether or not, in fact, the TSA officials counted as law enforcement officials given what they were doing um, sufficiently to have these searches that they do fall within the ambit of the Fourth Amendment. 
One of the interest, I think, most interesting issues that this case raised is the question of whether or not individuals have a choice to undergo these screenings. Because the dissent argued that, look, this cannot be a criminal proceeding because you have a choice about whether or not to be subjected to these screenings. And the majority said, now you don't have a choice. If you're flying, right, and you want to get on that plane, then you have to submit to the screening. But the dissent, of course, has as in its favor the suggestion that, well, you don't have to fly. Right? If you don't want to be subjected to this kind of screening, then you know, stay home or take the train. Um, not that they said that, but that was the, that was the suggestion. Um, so um, in my opinion, the majority was right to find that, in fact, uh, the TSA officials are acting as semi-law enforcement officials sufficient to um, entitle you to bring a Fourth Amendment challenge under the Alien Tort Claims Act uh, for a Fourth Amendment type challenge under the Alien Tort Claims Act for um, illegal treatment at the hands of TSA officials. Um, but the def- dissent very much disagreed with that point of view. Yes, uh, Matthew, you have something. I just want to say one thing. Just talk a little bit about, like, uh, so let's say they're not classified as law enforcement. The woman's constitutional rights were violated. What remedy does she have in that case? Then and she has no no remedy, really. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know any of you who fly on a regular basis. You've probably had rather uh, shabby treatment at times as you go through uh, the TSA checkpoints. You you really have no remedy at that point. Um, I mean, no matter if your constitutional rights are violated. There, there really isn't much of a remedy. So the, the um, Alien Tort Claims Act is a window in on a way that you can hold the state accountable despite the rather powerful impact of sovereign immunity. Um, And uh, I think this moves in the right direction. I was pleased. I didn't know this case either. Uh, It's a very recent case and was pleased to see such a strong majority coming out, uh, even uh, of some fairly conservative uh, judges coming out in in favor of the civil rights of, of a passenger in this case. So to me, the fascinating thing about this case is what light it sheds on the Third Circuit. Um, and uh, th- what you see here is that the, the majority opinion and the dissenting opinion are both written by ideologically similar judges, both of them moderate liberal judges, uh, basically this, you know, two of the most similar uh, judges on the court. And the conservative wing of the court is pretty evenly split between the majority and the dissent. And so I think it's really interesting to think about, well, what does that mean? Why is that? What is it about this case that split the moderate liberals and split the conservatives? And I think one way of looking at that is to say, well, Third Circuit's a centrist, non-ideological court, so that's what's going on here. They're not deciding this stuff on traditional ideological lines. Uh, and and they're they're kind of deciding it on its merits, and I think that might be an explanation for what happened here. But I think there's also a different way of looking at it here because the majority opinion, if you look at the outcomes, you think that the outcome is one that favors liberals. They like that they're in favor of plaintiffs being able to recover. They're they're more comfortable with uh, with government liability. So it looks like the liberals prevailed here. But the methodology that they used here was a very much a methodology favored by conservatives. The majority opinion is very laser focused on what the text of the statute says. And they say, we're not even going to talk about what the legislative history says here. And so I think it it may be that it reflects the, the court's basic centrism, but I think that's also possible that some of the judges were looking at this as a case that advanced textualism, and some of the judges were looking at the dissent as a viewpoint that that, uh, advanced a more pragmatic approach um, in looking at the policy effects of, of, of what the ruling was. And I think that maybe different judges on both sides of the ideological divide may have been looking at, at that differently. So it's kind of fascinating, I think, in, in terms of looking at how the, how the court shook out. Well, well, let's not forget also, though, that this re- reflects a split within conservatism. Um, I mean, you know, the, in the recent past, there was no stronger defender of uh, defendant rights and criminal rights than than Scalia. Um, So he had 
you know, very strong feelings about that. And I think that conservatism uh, here may be somewhat split between sort of wanting to give more power to the administrative state and protect it from lawsuits on the one hand, the dissent, and on the other hand, a, a somewhat more libertarian um, orientation that says, uh, hey, you know, don't don't mess with my person. Uh, and if you do and you're unjust about it, you're going to have to you're going to have to pay. Kind of Justice Gorsuch, Justice Alito split. A, a little bit. So yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, and Scalia, again, you know, had a number of opinions ruled with the liberals on the court um, around uh, defendant rights cases in criminal cases. I'm intrigued by uh by Matthew's point about the textualism, and I read it as a very textualist opinion. Uh, I think I'm with the dissent here. Uh, I think that the, the textualism of the majority really was quite wooden, in my view. So it wasn't just that the majority was interested in the text. They parsed the text into discrete words at a time. We're not, I think, very sensitive to the fact that an utterance communicates information. Uh, what an utterance contains is not ex only encoded in the particular words taken one by one. So it says, let's look at what a search is. Well, this is a search. What is an officer? They go to some dictionary definitions of what is an officer. As the dissent rightly points out, you have to defend your choice of dictionaries. And there were other contemporary dictionaries that defined officer as a police officer or as a law enforcement officer. And this definition is supposed to be a definition of what a law enforcement officer is. And it seems very, very plausible that uh, intuitively or conventionally TSA officials or, or employees, they're sort of low-level employees. They have got a lot of power in a sense. But they're low-level employees, and many people might not think of them as law enforcement officers. But I'm not going to go on at length trying to defend the dissent's view, but I want to say that I think that there is greater ambiguity in this provision than appears if you take it word by word. And if there is ambiguity, then it does open the door to two things that the, that the majority really gives the back of its hand to. One is legislative history. And if you look at the legislative history, it seems very supportive of the idea that the provision shouldn't apply here. And the majority, and, of course, says we will not even look at it. Right, but partly because they think that it's a slam dunk once you just look at the text, but their approach to looking at the text is, as I say, very piecemeal not the way we actually interpret utterances. And secondly, once you open the door to recognize some textual ambiguity, then we have a canon that uh, waivers of sovereign immunity are to be narrowly construed in favor of the government, in favor of the non-waiver of sovereign immunity. So I think as a policy matter, this is absolutely a good result. And I would like to see a statute which makes explicit that TSA officials can be held uh, liable for bad behavior. But I do think it's not merely a textual opinion, but a particular way of operationalizing textualism, which is, I think, rather naive and wooden. Well, if I can just answer that point, because I, I agree with you, Mitch, that the majority's textual analysis was not very strong. Um, and I, I take it as a little pretextual. That is, uh, um, I think, you know, had I been writing this opinion, it would have talked much more about the, um, the power and position that, that TSA officials uh, wield uh, over passengers and um, the weakness of the position that suggests that you really don't have to fly and so therefore these are not mandatory searches. As far as the textual analysis goes, I think you're right that a much more contextual analysis and one that allows for legislative history um, would have been the right way to go. But I don't think that the legislative history was clearly on the dissent side here either. So um, I, I think the um, it, it was sort of a bad opinion, but uh, I agree with you, the right result. Uh, but I don't think that that result would have been precluded by a more nuanced textual analysis. That's fair. Um, do you think that at the end of the day, that perhaps was an outcome-driven opinion more than anything in that if TSA agents get, if, 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 if TSA agents are not classified as law enforcement officers, then no remedy is available at all? Well, um, 
I think it's true that no remedy would have been available at all if they hadn't and gone the this way. And the court was kind way. of disturbed by but, it. But I think they just didn't really state the right basis for their opinion. So it, it just, um, it was weak to look at these dictionary definitions and, and, as Mitch says, to parse the words very narrowly. But but I think that that narrow reading, what, reading was not what was driving their opinion. It need not be outcome, you know, in a negative sense, outcome-based in order for the court to be really recognizing the place that TSA officers have um, and the power that they hold over over passengers and the significant power that they have to subject you to criminal charges, as happened in this case, um, because you, you go through that process rather unprotected and unprepared. I mean, I, I think it's interesting that the majority opinion was careful to, f- to really explicit in framing the opinion as not relying on the practical consequences of it. I, 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 they, they made very clear, they were like, we're doing a textual analysis, the textual analysis is what decides the case, and oh, by the way, at the end, we're going to talk about what we think the consequences of this are, but they're really very clear in cabining that as separate from the question of, of what, the, what the legal determination was going to be. So, it, you know, I mean, we can speculate about whether they were thinking about those kinds of factors in doing their textual analysis, right. but they were clear in saying that that was not a part of how they were doing the interpretation as a formal matter. Excellent. And that sounds like a good last word. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so we can't get to Tinio uh, versus United States Attorney General. But Matthew, we would love to have you on the short circuit and talk about this opinion again. Uh, as, just as long as I get my whole, uh, uh, my, uh, whole episode to myself <laughs> that I can talk about this, this case, that'll be perfect. Thanks very much, everybody. And it was great. Uh, thank you guys for hosting us. Thank you.